So my name is Jack Deslip, and I'm a, a member of the user services group here at NERSC. I'm going to sort of give you an, an introduction to building various types of applications at NERSC. That includes sort of using the compilers, linking, and then solving some common <laughs> um, build problem. The presentation URL is empty because I didn't quite know where it was going to be yet, but you can find it at this NERSC uh, user day web page. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few things here. So some, the first thing I want to tell you about is all the applications that are already available to you without having to build them. And go over the compilers and libraries and then sort of play a little game where we fix some common build problems in, in, in applications. So the, the, this is sort of odd in a, in a talk about building applications, but one thing to consider, I think, before you start building applications yourself is, is really whether you have to or not. And so I want to sell the point that NERSC offers sort of pre-compiled executables for more than a hundred different uh, applications. And um, usually what happens is that if there's sort of you know, more than one, sort of two, three, or more requests for a given application, then we'll tend to, to build it ourselves and and share with users. So if there's something that you that an application that you want and you think that other users are likely to also want it, uh, please send us an email. Let us know, and uh, we'll take it into consideration when we have sort of more than one of those requests. We'll we'll build it ourselves. So for example, in the material science domain, we have. Uh, quite a few applications. This is not actually even a complete list, but you can see uh, uh, quite a lot of the popular applications like VAS, Quantum Espresso, NWCAM, Siesta, etc. Uh, and you can see a more complete list of all the applications that are available by going to the following URL, which shows you um, sort of every version on all the different machines at NERSC and when they were installed and when they were made default. Um, so if you're looking for something, this is a good place to, to start to see if it's already already there. And then finally, if you if this doesn't sort of satisfy your needs, and there are a lot of our users who, even if we have built, for example, an application like Abinit, they may have made their own customizations or have other reasons to build it themselves. So one place to start is by going to the Abinit webpage at NERSC and looking at the compilation instructions, which basically is a list of how we built the package that is in the modules available at NERSC. And it's often a good starting point for, for you as well. So this is available on quite a few different applications in the web pages at NERSC. If it's not, you can also send us an email and we'll usually update the web page with, with our build instructions as well. Okay, so if, um, I think the first step in building an application is usually choosing which compiler is is right for you. And I think the NERSC environment is a little bit different than, say, a commodity Linux cluster that you might be used to at your sort of local organization. And one of the main differences, particularly on the Cray machine, like Hopper and Edison, is that we have these compiler wrappers that um, sort of are meant to save you a lot of time and uh, are the recommended way to basically um, compile your code instead of using the native commands um, directly. For, so for example, um, if you want to build your, your code with the, say the Portland Group compilers, you might be tempted to put in PGF90, PGCC, uh, lowercase and capital for the, for the C and C++ compilers. But what we actually recommend doing on, say, Hopper and Edison is to use the wrapper commands, FTN, CC, and capital CC, and on Carver, uh, the MPI F9, the MPI CC, and MPI CC. So what these compiler wrappers actually do is basically they're the same as the, the underlying commands, like PGF90, but they include a bunch of things for you for free that are designed to make your application run on, say, the Hopper or Edison um, and, and Carver environment. So, for example, they include the MPI, the, the correct MPI libraries to use on the on those machines, and they also include, by default, um, some other libraries like math libraries. And as you load modules written by uh, Cray, they also sort of automatically include 
um, some of those libraries into, into the wrapper itself. Um, so one of the tricky parts here, though, is that the same compiler command, for example, FTN, can actually refer to a, a number of different underlying compilers, depending on which program environment module that you have loaded. And so this is a little tricky. So when, by default, when you log into to Hopper, you have the PGI program environment uh, loaded. So if you do a module list, you'll see PRG, ENB, PGI loaded. Um, but if you want to, say, use the GNU Intel or Cray compilers, what you would do is you'd swap from that module to the GNU module, and I'll show you a little bit about these commands in a minute. Uh, but then you'd still use the same compiler commands, FTN, CC, and CC, and capital CC. The difference is they now basically are pointing sort of internally to either the GNU or Intel or Cray compilers under the hood. Uh, so FTN and, and CC themselves are not real compilers, they're basically just wrapping the program environment that you have loaded at the, at the given time. Okay, so what compilers are actually available on our machines now? So Hopper basically has these five different compilers available, PGI, GNU, Intel, Pascal, and Cray, and Carver and Edison have some subset of those available. Um, Edison, in particular, one of the new features is that Intel is the default programming environment, so if you, look, uh, if you get access to Edison and you do a module list, you'll see that PRG in, in is set to Intel, uh, or the PRG in Intel in, uh, module is loaded by default. And on Carver and Hopper, on the other hand, both PG, uh, PGI is the default compiler in both cases. Okay, so again, to swap between a, a given compiler environment, you would use this module swap, for example, PRG in Intel to PRG in GNU, GNU, if you have the Intel loaded, but you want to use GNU under the hood. And on Carver, what you need to do is a little bit different. You need to swap, uh, say, from PGI to GCC, and then you also want to swap OpenMPI to OpenMPI GCC. And that will basically cause MPI F90 to point to the relevant uh, GNU version instead of the, the Intel version. Okay, so that's a bunch of useful compiler options uh, on Hopper. The different compilers, these are our recommended list of optimization options. And this is sort of comes from my colleague Mike Stewart, who's compiled a bunch of different applications on on each machine and is determined sort of the fastest sort of default parameters across that list of applications. So generally PGI reference fast and GNU minus O3 fast math. And Intel and Cray actually surprisingly the, the default uh, basically no option is the is the best is the best choice to use. So if you want to use OpenMP, there's a bit of different syntax between the the the, the different compilers and and even sort of showing some of the debugging options are a bit different. So it's just saying the version and uh, getting sort of verbose information is actually the same. But then debugging things like checking bounds and turning on sort of debugging symbols um, is a little bit different on, on each one. So uh, there's a few tricks uh, in this list here that this verbose option is actually fairly useful. So particularly with the compiler options, it's hard to know sometimes what FTN, for example, is linking in um, to your program for free. So you want to know, like, you sort of know that they include some math libraries. You might have loaded um, HDF5 or NetCDF, and you want to know what you're getting for free. Well, one way to do that is basically to, to add minus V to your uh, to your link line, and it sort of shows you a verbose output of everything that had that FTN has sort of put in um, into your compilation. And another <laughs> cool uh, little trick that I use a lot is this minus WL minus Y and then a symbol name, for example, like DGEM from Blas. And this will actually report which library the linker is currently using for that for that basically uh, subroutine or function. So. So, for example, if you if you're confused exactly about which library you're getting DGEM from, let's say like you have MKL and libsci somehow loaded into your environment, you want to know which one it's actually coming from. Then this command will basically tell you exactly which library 
you're getting DJF from. Um, so the, the story is a little bit different on Edison, and Mike talked a, a bunch about this yesterday, so you can look at his slides on yesterday's website as well. Uh, one of the differences is that Intel, again, is the default compiler. We now recommend minus fast no uh, IPO as the default parameter. So no IPO basically turns off the interprocedural optimizations, which just tend to take uh, a really long time when you're compiling. And he found that they don't uh, add significantly to the performance on his test codes. Um, the other key difference here is that on Edison, unlike Hopper, at least for the time being, for the Intel environment, libsci is not included uh, by default. Uh, whereas for the PGI environment on Hopper, it was. So you basically have to manually <clears throat> add this math libs minus mkl equals cluster to get things like laws and lapack and scale lapack into your code. Okay. So just generally a conclusion with some tips for using compilers. Um, uh, use the compiler wrappers instead of the native compilers. So that's FTN, CC, CC on Edison and Hopper, and the MPI F90, MPI CC on Carver. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that FTN on Hopper and Edison, like the Cray machines, um, links in a bunch of the, the math libraries on uh, on Edison again with Intel. You have to add this extra line MKL equals cluster. Uh, but M MPI F90 on Carver does not. So on Carver, you're responsible for sort of finding and linking in your own math libraries from the modules that are available. And another thing to keep in mind is that Hopper and Edison are uh, statically linked by default. And that's because, as you learned earlier this morning, um, these Cray machines have stripped down versions of Linux on the, on the compute nodes. And so statically, uh, static executables are the recommended way to go. But on Carver, the, the compiler is dynamically linked by default. And so that uh, affects what you need at runtime in order to run the executable. And we can talk about that in a little bit more detail in a second. Uh, there are ways to actually run dynamically linked executables on Hopper if you really need it. Um, you can, I'd really recommend just consulting the, the web page on that. But it usually involves setting this environment variable or using the Cray uh, compatibility mode, CCM. OK, so I think I talked about these two tips earlier, but this is just a, a, an example uh, of what you can get out of FTN minus V. So in this case, I've, I'm, I'm doing FTN minus V on a simple little test to hello world.f90. And you see here that this is the list of things that FTN basically gave me for free. So in here is a libsci, which is actually the, the, the sort of math libraries of laws, lapack, scale lapack. And for example, to show exactly which library DGEM was in, you'd use this little trick that I like. And it tells you um, that there's a reference to DGEM and it's coming from libsci underscore new dot mpa, or dot mp dot a. Okay, so the key to finding, um, sort of, to, to solving undefined references or finding um, missing libraries at, at link time are to, to look at the module system. So chances are, if you're, if you're trying to link against a, a math library or an I.O. library or, or other common libraries, the so chances are that we already have it installed. And so it's, it's probably going to be in the module system. So if you know the exact name of the module, uh, the, way, the, the way that you'd bring it into your environment would be to, to use the module load FFTW command, for example, on Hopper. And what this will do is sort of dynamically uh, change your environment, particularly the path and LD library paths, and then maybe a few other environment variables, so that the, the executables and libraries become available. And so, for example, you could use the module avail FFTW command to see all the different versions of FFTW that we have available on, on the machine. And then if you want to look at what is it actually going to happen if you were to load a given module, you use module show, for example, FFTW 2.15, and it'll tell you 
how it's going to change your environment. So for example, it's going to add the following directory to your LD library path um, and, and then define a few other uh, uh, um, sort of environment variables that you can use uh, for convenience at link time. Okay, so I think uh, sometimes the most useful thing, um, way to learn how to build things at, at NERSC is just kind of compile, try to compile something yourself, run into problems, and then work through the solutions. So I have a little game where there's about, I think there's four different common problems that we see all the time in consulting, and we'll try to go through them and see if we can figure out uh, what the solutions to these, these problems are. I think we should start ending on iPods now. Right, yeah. Like we should probably make the prizes more, more appealing. Um, so people that are on the phone, you can feel free to kind of shout out the answer if you think, if you, think you know as well. Um, OK, so this is, uh, this is an example of compiling Quantum Espresso on, on Hopper. So I've, I've looked at the readme file, and it says um, for the quick, in, quick installation instructions for the impatient, which is good because I'm impatient. Uh, it says to run dot configure and then make all. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. So I ran dot configure success. That's great. I run make all. I come back in 20 minutes and it's success. So that's that's great. It couldn't be possibly any easier, right? And then I go to run it in the application. I do uh, as sort of Kirsten was, was uh, demonstrating earlier, I submitted in a batch script with the following AP run line, AP run minus N5, the executable I just built, gave it some in file. And then the problem is, I'm looking at the output and I see like every single line of the output just five times. And it's, it, it, if I run it, for example, on 10 processors, it takes the same amount of time, it's just like, it, like 10 times the amount of output out. So does anyone anyone have a guess of what went wrong there? Okay, so so this is a little it's a little tricky, and so I think all right, is, is somebody on the phone? <laughs> okay, so um, right, so the output looks weird and repeated. So the solution here is that by default the configure script for this application didn't pick up the compiler wrappers FTN CC capital CC they can um, and what you need to do is really tell configure where what compilers you want to use so by default what happened is that the configure script found sort of the the serial compiler or the, the native compilers PG F90 PG CC PG PG capital CC and those are the ones that, that uh, basically don't include MPI. So what happens is we just, when I ran AP run minus N5, my executable, just ran the serial version five times. And that's why I had exactly five sort of times the output that, that, I, that I saw. So if I looked at the make.sys that the configure command built, I found in it that it, it had to use MPI F90, PG F90. And I really wanted that to be set to FTN, the, M, the MPI wrapper. So if something seems too good to be true, it's possible that it is, and that you may want to, you may have to do a little bit more digging to get exactly what you want there. OK, so the next, the next problem is uh, I'm compiling another code, Berkeley GW, on, on Hopper. And I learned sort of from my quantum espresso mistake that I don't want to use the, <coughs> the PGF90 compiler. I want to use this, this compiler FTN. And uh, I found this other arch.make, but I didn't really know what to do with some of the rest of it. I know that I should give fast the option. But then I typed make, and it didn't, and it didn't compile. And I got the following, um, the following error, undefined reference to FFTWND F77, something or other. So. So what do we think went wrong here? Anyone, anyone have a guess? Anyone on the phone? All right, so this one is maybe a little bit um, more 
uh, more straightforward. So basically, an undefined reference error usually means that you are missing some sort of library at link time. And in this case, we are missing the, the FFTW <coughs> library. So if I look at um, at what FTN gives me for free, we'll see that FFTW, at least on Hopper, is not uh, included for free. So basically what you need to do is load the FFTW module as shown on the right, and then in include the following link line uh, um, in the in sort of whatever make.sys or arch.make or configure options that your particular package uh, provides. OK, so the next round, um, I sort of learned from my previous mistake. And I went to build the same package on Carver. And in this case, I was careful to include in the, in the conf file the FFTW locations. I know that on Carver, I don't get things like Blas, Lapack, and Scalapack for free, so I added that. Um, so I also loaded the MKL module and added that for Lapack and Scalapack. I was able to, to compile the code, but then later that day when I actually go to run it, so that I went to lunch and I came back and I went to run it, I, I got the following error. So when I tried to run the code, I got error while loading shared library mkl blah 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 cannot open a shared object file or something like that. And so that's confusing because I definitely put it in my in my comp file. Um, so this is another problem that we often get questions about. And the trick here is that on Carver, um, unlike Hopper, you're using dynamic executables. So that means when you link against something like MKL, it's not built into your executable. It's required that it be <coughs> in your environment at runtime in order for you to run it. So, so the key here is that uh, on Carver, any libraries that you that you link in at build time, you have to add to your LD library path at runtime. And so this is often done on Carver by just loading the module again. So if you do module load MKL and FFTW, uh, and then in your batch script, right, right above the MP run line, MPI run line, then that should solve your problem. Or you could manually export the directories that you need into your LD library path as well. So would, wouldn't you really want to set LD run path when you compile? Um, that I guess is one option, but um, it may be in the future that you, you built this with one version of a library and then eventually want to you know, sort of allow at runtime to use sort of a newer version of the library, for example. And I think this would allow a little bit more flexibility in, in that route to basically um, you know, potentially allow the same executable to be run for multiple uh, different library versions, or if you rebuild it for some reason or something like that. So the way it was explained to me is LD library path is if you're doing debugging, but if indeed you want to use the same library all the time, since LD library path is a debugging option, you have to move it to LD run path and do it before you compile. That's not what you've heard. That's not the. That's not. Um, I'm not familiar with that. That's not the way we, we set things up. Usually, um, we have these mod. Have you, we haven't talked about modules. I guess. Did you talk about modules? Yeah. You did a little bit. So, typically, we, these are defined in the module files. So, if you load a module for whatever compiler you're using, it's set at compile time, and then we, we um, ask people to, to load the same module when they run. So that sets it at runtime too. Okay. But um, I, I hadn't I hadn't heard of using that environment variable, but I'll certainly look into it, and because it sa it sounds like that that hard codes that into the executable if you do that at compile time. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. Okay. So I think at NERSC we usually uh, compile some applications in one place, 
and then we move it to some installation directory. So we prefer load library path instead of the R path one. So because um, if you use R path, you have to keep all those source directory, you know, whatever you, you use, then you compile. Yeah. So it's not preferred option for us. I guess right. that's why we didn't prepare for, but it's, it's uh, I mean, if you, in terms of users, you know, use the case, I think uh, they can do many ways to make uh, the runtime library available to their applications. They can use R pass at compile time, and, and they, uh, they can also set this load run pass environment, and then also use the load library pass. But in terms of search order, I think load library pass is the number one if, if you look. Right. Right. Yeah, I think you're, you're right, Zengji, and you, you point out something I, that I've kind of forgotten about is we, all the software that we install, all these application software we install is non-privileged users, so um, they will typically not go in user bin or someplace they might kind of want to go a lot of times, so we tend to move them around places and use modules to configure where, the, where they actually live. Right. Um, right. So I, I, I hope that sort of answered your, your question. Okay, so the final problem um, that we see fairly frequently is demonstrated in this example um, uh, of compiling this, this library, ETSF IO on Hopper. So what I do here is I module uh, swapped the GNU environment because I know that's what sort of this package needs. I load uh, the netcdf module. Um, I run uh, the following configure script, which somebody in the know has, has, has given me, and that I knew that I, I ran it sort of just three weeks ago and it worked uh, just totally fine. And then now when I run it today, and this is what's really frustrating, is that uh, I get this this problem, no net CDF library found uh, during the, the configure step. So basically it was trying to test net CDF and it somehow finds, finds that net CDF is broken. But again, I knew that this worked just one month ago, so, so what could be going on uh, here? And the, this one is really kind of tricky to just know the answer without digging a little deeper. <coughs> and so part of the solution is to, is to know that to debug configure errors, it's, the place to look is, is usually in the config.log file. And so if we look at what was actually going on in the config.log file, it's trying to, to verify that the NetCDF on the machine is working by compiling the, the following really short program, which basically is just an F90 program that imports NetCDF. Um, and what's it say? So it says, uh, when it was trying to use NetCDF, it says wrong module uh, version 4, expected version 6 for file netcdf.mod uh, opened at 1. And so what happened here is that we're trying to use a module that was built with GCC 4.5, but sometime in the last two weeks, the uh, the pesky people at NERSC must have changed what the default GCC was on the machine to 4.6, so that this module that um, that I was using and I sort of hard coded the path to um, from a couple weeks ago is no longer the right one to use. And this is sort of particularly problematic with GCC, where um, they're, they're more like the the, the modules seem to be in a different format, even at various like sub uh, or, or I guess uh, end point X releases or sub releases. Um, for PGI, it seems like they they they're compatible for a little bit uh, longer. But so the the key here is that the module that you're trying to use is basically compiled with a different compiler than the one uh, than the one that you're now using. And um, so the recommendation <clears throat> would be to, to get rid of this hard-coded path to the netcdf module that you put in and just use sort of module low netcdf and see what environment variables that gives you that you can you could use to define the include. And uh, and uh, the other the, the other thing to learn is that to look at the config.log to sort of figure out what's going on with the configure errors. 
Okay, so finally, uh, as a summary of sort of good practices um, for building applications at NERSC, um, uh, you should sort of use uh, generally use developer recommended compiler and compiler options so long as NERSC has support for, for that compiler. Always use the compiler wrappers whenever available. And um, if you're having trouble sort of matching or, or successfully completing a test suite, try your application at lower optimization levels first and, then, and see if you can pass at those levels. And whenever possible, use the system provided libraries. And so I guess that is it. So there's a, there's a ton of information on the website about building uh, applications and, um, and, and running and, and compilers and recommended options. Uh, so I recommend that you, that you check out the web page. Are there, are there any other questions? Thanks, Jack.